So good morning. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the shoulder, um, and you know we'll touch on the physical exam. So you know you may have to examine the patient, actually talk to the patient, and rather than just look at the chart. So you, this is your fancy uh, office consultation room. So Mr. Jones comes in and he says he was reaching for a line drive two weeks ago and his shoulder hurts. Or maybe it's somebody who says, you know, I just can't sleep at night or, in, or I can't play tennis. Somehow their shoulder is messing up their life. So you examine as we're going to talk about later. And then you have a lot of options. What are you going to do with this guy to get him out of your office in seven minutes or whatever you're allowed to see the patient? Is it seven minutes? Anyways. Uh, Seven, Bob? Okay, five? Five minutes, okay. So you can either order an x-ray if it's not been done. You can give the guy some pills, whether you give him pain pills or any inflammatories. You can do some therapy, show him some exercises, or send him to therapy. You can do injections, get an MRI, or you can refer the person. So you got some options to, to do this. So this is the extremely simple shoulder exam. So myself, Dr. Henneke, who's one of my shoulder buddies down at Scripps Green, and Dr. Petricelli, uh, one of our fellows from a year ago, put this together. So if you look at your shoulder, can you put your arm over your head? Okay. Now reach behind your back, or your head, rather. Okay. Now let your arm down. Now bring your arm up and with your hand forward in how high, it only goes so far. So to reach the back of your head, you have to spin it. And if your shoulder's screwed up, it doesn't spin. And then the patient said, I, I can only go to here, the damn thing hurts. Well, that's because it, it ain't spinning, it's, it's not moving right. Second thing is, can you reach behind your back to your bra strap or whatever's there? Okay. Uh, so if you can't get back there, then it's stiff. And he said, well, I can't get my hand in my back pocket to pay the check or, or whatever. So this is, isn't rocket science. So first we're gonna just talk about the, the uh, simple shoulder exam. So this is Gabe. So you ask the patient, bring both arms overhead. That looks pretty smooth. Put your hand behind your head. See how it spins and it rotates. Now she gonna, you're gonna test forward flexion, the strength. Now you bring the arm to the side and we measure external rotation. And watch how both shoulders, see how they rotate out, they come in. Now, now you just do a little bit of pressure so you detect the strength of part of the back of the rotator cuff. And you can get your hand behind your back and finally you can point over the AC joint. Where the AC joint is right over the tip of your shoulder or where your bra strap is. And that's all you need to do. That's, that's all I, just bring your arms over. Can you put your hands here or there? And maybe they're, they're it's screwed up in some way and it doesn't work right. Now when your shoulder comes overhead, your ball moves in the socket and your shoulder blade moves. Uh, and the, the rotator cuff sits the ball in the socket so the big muscles like the deltoid can lift your arm overhead. Um, this is similar to when I was growing up in Cleveland, we used to paint our house every so often in the summer, and you had these really cool extension ladders, and you put your foot on the bottom rung, and then you'd swing the, the ladder up to the second or third story. So what happens in the shoulder is the rotator cuff sits the ball in the socket that has the labrum around it, and then the big muscles sh push the ladder up, the deltoid, pec major, and these other other muscles, and that's why that girl can bring her arm overhead. So there's only seven diagnostic lumps you need to know about, and uh, one is the loose shoulder, it's unstable, it's slipping out of the socket. These are usually young people. You may have just arthritis, and that's a person that's got a stiff shoulder, or maybe a lot of pain, generally they're older. You can have acute calcific tendonitis. These people come in with lots of pain. And if your uh, office says you can't come in the next week, they, they keep calling back because they're very unhappy. You can have people with massive rotator cuff tears. They can't get their arm up, but we'll see that in a minute. You can have stiff shoulders that I think is probably the most common cause of shoulder pain and it's unrecognized. You can have AC joint arthritis or tenderness 
And then this whole group of rotator cuff impingement where the shoulder's not spinning right for, for some reason. So these are the diagnostic lumps. So you see the top one's instability and the next two are arthritis and calcium. So how are you gonna make a diagnosis? Well, the history will tell you at instability. You have to talk to the patient and say, what happened? My shoulder went out, I was surfing in this, or I was sliding in the second base, or I, I turned over in bed and something happened. So the patient will tell you whether they have instability or not. And you're not gonna find out whether they have an instability from an MRI, you're only gonna find it out by talking to the patient. And, uh, and so you, you have to you know, say what, at least say what happened and then maybe listen for 30 seconds or a minute of your five minute time to hear what they have to say. And that'll pick out the patient. Now these people may have what we call an apprehension test. So here's her right shoulder and you can see Gabe's pulling back and she's gonna like throw a ball and trying to see how the ball sets in the socket and that's fine. Now you come to her other shoulder, and this is the one that bothers him, and you start to push it back, and they'll tell you right then that, that, that they don't like it. So even though he's a big guy, she's not gonna let him push anymore. And that's basically all you need to know about the exam that this woman has on unstable shoulder. And then whether you send him to therapy or refer him to an orthopod, that's, uh, a choice depending on how much it's messing up their life. So now the instabilities at the top, two, the next two were missing, that was arthritis and calcium. Well, that's pretty, pretty simple. You have a, um, somewhere there's a pointer on here. Oops, wrong way. Anyway, oh, I got it, the top one. So there's a big hunk of calcium uh, in that x-ray and so when this person tries to bring their arm up, it doesn't rotate and they hurt. And, or they may have osteoarthritis. So you can see this joint is narrow. There's big uh, osteophytes down here and up at the top. So you, got your, you, you can use an x-ray. If the x-ray is normal, then they don't have calcific tendonitis or they don't have osteoarthritis. So now we're left with what are the other things you can look for? There's a massive rotator cuff tear. Now this is a person that can't set the ball in the socket. So they, they just can't get their arm up, even though their deltoid's working because the ball's not setting in the socket. It's like lifting the ladder to the second story when there's ice on the ground. It's not a stable platform. Or they may be really stiff so they can't get their arm behind their back and they have lots of pain or they're tender over the AC joint. So now here, remember, we just look how nice and smooth that arm comes overhead. So this is like watching somebody walk. Are they limping or not? Can, is there strength there? See, she's not screaming at them, not worried about that. Now you do external rotation. See that there's nice smooth motion and then you push out and there's no uh, uh, resistance. I mean, there's no uh, weakness and now she can has symmetrical movement behind her back and her shoulder blades are moving uh, very nicely. I think now, why don't you click that uh, to start? So now this, this woman has a frozen shoulder and see how she can't get her arm behind her head. Now watch at the side. See there's limited external rotation on the right and she gets back to her back and now this side you can't. So that's a stiff shoulder. That's not rocket science, it's just a stiff shoulder. Here we go again, we're looping through this. She has limited external rotation. So this is a stiff shoulder. Now her MRI might say she has a rotator cuff tear, labrum tear. I mean, everybody has an abnormal MRI, it seems these days. But you gotta examine the patient and then decide how you're gonna treat the frozen shoulder, usually with an injection or something. Whoops. Now click on this one. Now here's a guy with a big cuff tear. So you ask him to lift his arm up. 
It just, it ain't going up there, see? And so that may be a stiff frozen shoulder also, but then he can take his other arm and put his arm over head. So that shoulder's not stiff, the muscle just is not working, uh, working right. And then when he externally rotates, you can see his right doesn't go out as far. I don't know where Gabe turned that camera. I'm not sure where that came from. So that's so that person has a massive uh, cuff tear. So if the what he, to make a diagnosis, one is to loose the instability. We do that by uh, people by history and sports. You have an arthritic shoulder, it has pain, so it may act like the guy that can't lift his arm up, or the women, but they have a, a bad looking x-ray, whereas that man had a nice looking x-ray, as did that, uh, that woman. And then the calcium uh, x-ray. So we're back to the final four, which is impingement. Uh, where active is equal to passive range of motion. I went through the uh, frozen shoulder and then the massive uh, cuff tear where the active motion is less than the passive. And AC joint arthritis, I can't read that, neither can you, I, or maybe you can. And that's tenderness over the AC joint. So that's basically all that you need to know on, on making a diagnosis. So what are you gonna do? Well, you can inject some of these if you want. <clears throat> Frozen shoulders, you can inject, and that uh, that may help some people. Now, frozen shoulder is a, people don't like to know this, but frozen shoulder is a disease process that people don't like diseases. They like tears and injuries if they come to the orthopedist. So it's a disease where the joint starts out with synovitis and it's inflamed, and uh, it looks like, like pink eye, or, or it's a very red inflamed joint, and that's where cortisone may help. Then the capsule starts to thicken, much like a Dupatron's does in the hand, and, and you get stiffness. And then finally the pain can go away and you're just left with stiffness. Now the good thing about frozen shoulder is most of them, 90, 95%, will return to normal, but it may take six to 24 months. So I tell my patients to look up frozen shoulder on the internet, and then they'll be really depressed because they realized I'll never get well. So I think the internet, the internet's actually my friend in the office in telling them what to do. And the therapist can help them with slow, gentle stretching. The problem is many of the therapists turn into physical terrorists and they're beating the patient up and they're scared to death. And when the time I see them, I have to say, you know, just don't do anything. Maybe slide your hand on a table and do a little slow, uh, uh, stretching, but you have to tell them it's a long time uh, getting well. And uh, just as Dupatron's is a little higher in people with diabetics, frozen shoulder is higher in uh, patients that have diabetes. Then the calcific tendonitis patients, you can inject calcium and sometimes you get lucky and you, their pain will go right away, will go away right away. Arthritis, you know, if you tell them well, you, you got a choice, you want a shot or a total shoulder joint, most people would rather have an injection, and often they'll get amazingly good relief for a prolonged period of time. So, you know, you tell them you're gonna, gonna make them better, and, and, and patients will give you all the reasons not, not to inject them uh, their, their shoulder. Either they don't like cortisone or it's not gonna cure me, and, and I have to say, well, you know, it's, it's better than an operation, and it may make you better. And, I don't know, we live in Southern California, so I just mentioned a cortisone shot and I kind of watched their pupils and some dilate and flush and you know, they, they, that's, you know, they would rather have their spine operated on than have a cortisone injection. And other people will wait in your office all day so they can get a cortisone shot because they have a golf game tomorrow morning and they only came because I'm gonna be the savior with the cortisone. So impingement, small cuff tears, labrum tears, these are patients who their arm comes up, it doesn't spin real well, <clears throat> they may have a small cuff tear, and often they respond to uh, injections. Uh, <clears throat> there's just a study, you know, we think we know what we're doing, but I'm not sure we do. I'm, I know we don't, and with regard to, uh, yeah, I probably can't hear you, you have to yell loud. Eric, the cortisone injection in the shoulder, what do you tell them to expect 
sensitivity? How much restriction do you have them do in the next week or so? So what do I tell them after cortisone injection? I just tell them to go for it. I don't think, I don't think it makes any difference whether you tell them the rest or what. I put a little, I usually put one cc of xylocaine, one marcaine, and a couple cc's of steroid. I usually use celestone if they didn't run out of it in, in, the, in the factory. And then I just tell them to, to, go for, to go for it. I don't tell them not to use their arm. Because I think most people ignore us anyways, so they, they're going to do however it, it uh, feels. Now, the small cuff tear is interesting. There's a group that's looked at evidence-based medicine, and it's, a, uh, it's uh, based out of uh, uh, Vanderbilt, and it was called the Moon Study Group. And they study different orthopedic uh, things. So they took people with very small cuff tears, and they sent them the physical therapy to see if they would get better or not. And they asked the patient, you know, what do you think about physical therapy? And then they measure their age, the size of the tear, the muscle atrophy, uh, their comorbidities, on and on and on. So the only thing that significantly made a difference on uh, physical, on whether they were going to get better was whether the patient thought the therapy would help or not. So the patients who think therapy is going to help uh, do very well with therapy. And other people say, well, why are you going to operate on my shoulder? Or why, why are you going to send me to therapy? You know my shoulder's not going to heal, and the, the rotator cuff tears don't heal. Therefore, operate on me. And you have to say, well, not you, you may get better without therapy. So. Uh, Many of these small t uh, cuff tears will do well with therapy. The cuff, it doesn't heal, but the patients feel better. And finally, AC joint arthritis is right on the tip of the shoulder and take a small uh, needle and drop some uh, cortisone into the joint. It's not that hard to hit, but sometimes you can pop it in there. So those are injecting uh, d d things. So where do you want to get a consult and just you know send them over to someone else to get the patient out of your office and so forth? Well, people that have recurrent shoulder instability, so the shoulder is dislocating all the time, uh, those people we do surgery on. People that have arthritis and they're not happy with their, their lifestyle, they're, I ask people, when is the pain in your shoulder messing up your life? You know, one, I had one lady last week had her, a bad shoulder pain, and um, but her other arm's fine. And she looks, and I said, "Well, you got a bad shoulder to right." She said, "What the hell? I need my other, my shoulder for? Should I live in assisted living? They do everything for me. They cook, make my meals." And and she just had a whole different attitude toward a bad shoulder. Like I only need one anyways. Don't worry. So you have to see what the patient uh, thinks about having surgery or not. Frozen shoulders, if they don't get better after eight to 12 months of, of uh, non-operative treatment, then we'll, we'll uh, manipulate their shoulder. The uh, calcium and may not get better after time, so, and then if they just fail to get better with those uh, shots. So when we get an MRI, well, a couple places I find it helpful. One is the acute mass of tear. So this is the guy that comes in. You have to talk to the patient. Says, my shoulder was fine, and all of a sudden, I can't lift it. I can't. Well, how long can't you lift it? Ever since I fell down in the bathroom two days ago or two weeks or two months ago. So it's an acute mass of cuff tear, and that's totally different uh, uh, onset than uh, chronic uh, cuff tears where people just say, I hurt and now my arm doesn't, doesn't go up very well. Because many of these we can repair uh, early on when the, when the cuff is torn. So I tell patients, like you get wearing your favorite Levi's or shorts, you got a little hole in them, but you keep wearing them. And then all of a day, what, one day you bend over and boom, it goes. And so this, this is what happens with this tissue and you have a chance to repair it. You have, uh, may have this cuff tear patient. You expect the patient that doesn't spin right with their arm and didn't get well with your non-operative uh, treatment. The f other group is the dislocation. There's people over 40 who dislocate their shoulder. Maybe they fell down at home or playing tennis and they can't lift their arm. These patients are different than the young patients with instability, because often they have a big rotator cuff tear at, at the same time, and I'll do an MRI on them uh, right away to be sure, unless they have full motion like a week after surgery. 
And then finally, we have these uh, throwers, people who are in sports that don't get well with non-operative treatment. A couple helpful additional thoughts. If you look at the age, you know, you know we, we're sort of, uh, when you make diagnosis, we're basically gamblers. We sort of play odds. So if they're under the age of 25, you think of instability. Over 25, this impingement. Over 45, you start to get cuff tears. Over 65, certainly a cuff tear. Females have a frozen shoulder is common, the diabetics and frozen shoulder. And finally, the uh, weightlifters that have AC joint arthritis is a, a fairly uh, a, a significant. So what about this ex external rotation? Do they have active, limited, and passive? It doesn't, their arm doesn't go to the side. They tend to be frozen shoulder patients. Their arm doesn't go out, but yet with their other arm, you can push it all the way out. That would be the massive uh, cuff tear. Uh, and then finally, their, their motion is good, maybe a little bit uh, limited, but they have pain when their arm uh, spins overhead. So finally, the, we do surgery when people don't get well, and I just want to me, uh, sort of measure a uh, couple thoughts on that. Instability, we do arthroscopic labral repairs, and we bat about 80%. It, is, it isn't a really great operation, as the sports page would let you know, and not everybody gets well. People with bad arthritis, we do types of total shoulder replacements, and they do very well. They tend to be very grateful. The calcium that doesn't get well with a shot, we can go in with the arthroscope and cut out the calcium. The massive cuff tears, uh, we can do what's called a reverse total shoulder replacement. And this has kind of changed dramatically our uh, surgical patients. These people before that had a massive cuff tear couldn't lift their arm up. You could basically do nothing for them or maybe do a, a, put a new ball in, but you didn't do a reverse shoulder and they didn't do very well. Frozen shoulder, we can manipulate. AC joint arthritis is pretty rare, but you can cut out that joint. And then the uh, rotator cuff repair, we uh, if failed non operative uh, treatment. Now, the last thing, the new kit on the block, this is a total shoulder. So you put a ball and a socket in. The rotator cuff up at the top you, uh, is intact. So you just, basically they have a bad bearing surface. They're, it's like they have a flat tire, they have a bald tire. So you put a new tire on, but the motor and everything else is moving okay. So this has a ball that sits in a socket. Now the reverse shoulder has a socket that sits in a ball. Some people say it should be called inverse, but anyways. And the reason is that, here's the, the ball. So you have a socket in a ball. <coughs> And you don't need a rotator cuff, so the, the ladder going up to the second floor is stabilized by this constrained or reverse shoulder, and then the deltoid uh, does the difference. So probably half of the arthroplasties that I do with Dr. Hartman now are reverse shoulders, because before we couldn't help these patients. They were miserable, they couldn't sleep at night, and now you can take away their pain and probably get up back so most of them can can get their head to their hair and fix their hair. So anyways, this is just sort of an overview of uh, uh, my thoughts on uh, how to approach a, a shoulder patient. It's not very simple, just have them move their arm around a little bit. If it doesn't move all the way, then you know something's screwed up, you know? It's just like watching somebody walking, they have a limp. And, and that's the, the same thing. And I have a website and uh, uh, an email if anybody wants to send me an email or any questions. So uh, thank you very much.